the cards are laid out on the table. Fate has been cast. You go through the reading, card by card, knitting it together, weaving together the view of the future that the cards have. Is it seriously telling me that I'm going to start crocheting stuffed animals? That can't be right. Wait, why am I surrounded? Oh, it was right. Huh. Tarot cards and oracle cards are weird. And they're very commonly used by people who I don't think know what they are. We're going to talk about them today in detail as we walk together down Creation's Paths. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie. I am a Christo Pagan who druid and priest of Bridget. Hello everyone, I'm a mischief maker. The tarot cards called me so. They really did. I had an idea for how we would do this episode and the tarot cards are basically said, stop causing mischief. Yes. That was the answer. Yes. So we're not doing that because don't tempt fate. We're going to talk about some misconceptions about both tarot and oracle cards. We're going to talk about the usage of them. This isn't a how to use tarot. It is kind of how to use any oracle card, whether it's tarot or some other deck, but more like how to align yourself with it and understand what you're actually getting because tarot is a different beast. It's closer to doing a rune casting than it is to doing any of the other forms of scrying and divination I've talked about before. So we'll talk about all that in just a minute. Before we get into it, though, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology is on whatever app you're listening to us on. We do original Crystal Pagan and Druid content five days a week, Monday through Friday, on this show, and you don't want to miss a single thing. We got a lot coming up, especially in the run up to Sawan. You don't want to miss anything. We got a lot of good stuff for you. All right, let's just get into it. First and foremost, I love tarot. I love tarot. I love tarot. I love tarot. I love oracle card decks to the point where I have several that I use, and I have made two oracle card decks for myself over the years. I love this form of divination. I love cartomancy. But, oh, cartomancy drives me crazy. So cartomancy, if you don't know, is the word for the magic related to cards. Anything we're using cards for any kind of divination or magic, you're, you're doing a form of cartomancy. You can even use a regular deck of playing cards, which is actually how I got into this. When I was in middle school, there was a girl named Amethyst who brought in a regular deck of cards and would read people's future with the facts. I thought this was fascinating. I got really into this. I got really into using just regular decks of cards. Imagine my surprise as a child when I found out that there are things called tarot cards that have even more cards and are specifically designed for this purpose. And I discovered other kinds of oracle cards for various purposes. Got all excited, got all into it. And I have so many tarot card decks you don't even want to know. It's not a problem because I have limited funds. If I did not have limited funds, it would definitely be a problem. I have a long wish list of tarot card decks I would like to get. And I have some friends that enable me in this, but my current favorite tarot card deck it's actually a Lovecraftian themed tarot card deck that I use most. I also have a Druid themed tarot card deck that I do like as well. I have an issue with it if don't like the card texture. Really big on card texture if you're making a tarot card deck. Texture your cards a little bit if they're too slippery. Because you're classy, you have the Rider Waite deck. I learned on a combination of both the Rider Waite deck, which is the classic when you think tarot, you're probably thinking of the Rider Waite deck. I learned on the Thoth Tarot from Alistair Crowley, which if you have studied ceremonial magic, it's basically each card is a cheat sheet for what the card needs. Really Here's is. all of the correspondences that link to this card. So when you're reading it, here are all the correspondences that link to this card. You almost get to mix in some like black mirror scrying in oh. with your tarot card divination because basically it's like, well, what, what of the symbols pops out to you in yeah. the moment? So that's how I learned tarot. I need to say this very upfront. Memorizing a book is not the same as learning how to read tarot. Those card meanings are suggestions. And anybody who tries to tell you differently is not practicing tarot. Now, I'm not saying that those card readings are wrong, but to give one of my least favorite cards, I have stopped a tarot reading when this card came up because when I see it, I don't want to know what it means. The Three of Swords. Mm -hmm. Three of Swords to me is the most demonic card in the entire tarot deck. It could mean a lot of different things very often. I think it's generally worded as disappointment, I think, in a lot of books on tarot. Every time I've had the Three of Swords pop up in the tarot reading, 
it's almost always because that person has an unprocessed trauma that either recently happened or happened in their childhood that is preventing them from going forward. And I don't need to know those stories, but you start reading the card and you see this look of shock in their eyes. I had one person slap me because she thought that I knew something about her that I shouldn't have known. And I was like, I am just reading the cards. And so what the cards are telling me, because cards are an intuitive art. They're focusing you in a general direction. There are different methodologies to read the tarot. I tend to like a much more hermetic reading of the tarot. So I'm looking at how they connect to the Kabbalistic tree of life, the various elements. I don't do a lot of the astrology stuff, but there is an astrological association with each card. If that's your thing. And also just knowing what the energy is for the card, trying to open myself up and be much more intuitive to find out what does that card mean in relationship to the cards around it and for the person I'm doing the reading for. The Three of Swords is always, I'm going to learn something about this person that I don't want to know. That, Which always cracks me up because most people would think when the devil shows up or death, those would be the ones that they would be like, oh my gosh, the death card showed up. Death is a change, a transition. Change. We're about to go through another one in something. The fun thing is in the prior crystal pagan practice, we practice eight transitions a year and four transitions every month so as we go through the different limb phases yeah if you really want to get good at tarot you need to start developing a holistic view one card pulls are fine there's nothing wrong with a one card pull but if you're using any kind of spread what is not just that card telling you understanding the layout why the cards are in the order that they are how they interconnect and interact with each other in the order that you're putting them down how they are building, telling the story as you're going through them will really help you in your ability to read them and have better accuracy. And also really getting into that intuition of, I know this card generally means this, but in this context with these other cards around it, I'm really feeling that it actually means this. And again, it's like we always talk about when we talk about intuitive practice, that's a lot of trial and error. Learning the meanings of the cards is helpful because you are learning the generalized energies that are in the cards. If you have any cards from cups, wands, prior to that three of swords that I hate so much, oh, some relationship went really bad in this person's past or is currently going all. This is my experience. Your reading experience may be different, but when I see that water or that fire energy pouring into this, in the swords energy, this air energy, something hurt their mind, something from their emotional life or their passionate life is affecting their mind and causing this, this pain, this problem. And again, that's usually stuff I don't want to know. When it's a uh, coins or pentacles, someone usually died. That's what I found when doing readings or something was stolen. That's learning that intuition. This is how these readings work for me. And they work this way for others as well. I'm not saying that I'm special in this, but you need to learn those associations for yourself. When I say that pentacles is earth, mons is fire, cups is water, and swords is air that is very traditional that is also how i tend to experience those cards there's also suit order i almost always feel that the queen is the high suit in the deck rather than the king again your mileage may vary but i work the blood more feminine energy when i'm doing my spirit work so that's probably why trying to parse this out learning to connect because when you're dealing with the cards unlike with various forms of scrying like we talked about in yesterday's episode that you're connecting to your intuition, but in a very intuitive, energy-based way. What am I seeing in this cardomancy? You're pulling on both your understanding, study, and your intuition to come together. It's much more like baking or cooking than it is just doing something off the cuff. You're following a recipe to a certain degree because the cards do carry a weight with them which may or may not be the textbook, like the literal book that the cards came with meaning. Learning when to ignore the strict definitions that are generally given to the cards and what they are actually trying to tell you is such a subtle art. It's something that I don't see a lot of people doing in tarot. It's one of the reasons why I often will judge somebody's magical practice by how they read tarot. And so when a practitioner and I start hanging out, they will very often be like, hey, can I read the cards for you? I can tell a lot about your personal magical practice by how you read those cards. You'll start noticing this yourself when you're having these interactions with people because you will get to see how much of their intuition they're tapping into, 
you'll be able to see what traditions of magic that they rely on most heavily in their practice. You'll also be able to see how by the book, how rigid they are in their practice based on how they read the cards. And I say all this not to scare people away from tarot, but I feel like people take tarot, like most things in magic, way too serious. Tarot is a tool. There is no innate power in tone. When I was first taught how to read tarot, my teacher told me that we shuffle the deck because life is chaotic. And so by adding our, a touch of our own chaos and how we feel the cards should be turned, twisted, how many times they should be bridged together, adding that chaos into it, we're basically adding the chaos of our life into the deck so that it will reflect our lives better. I like that idea. I don't know that that's testable, provable. It's kind of like with, with, with what comes in with attunement. When you're having someone attune themselves to the deck, that's a lot of what it is, is they're, they're putting their energy into it when they're shuffling you, both physically and through the subtler energies. This way, then, the deck is aligned more towards that. So when the probability of certain cards coming up, once again, you're working with those subtle energies, so it's subtly being shifted towards things that are going to be more in, in alignment. Say you're looking for an answer to a question. This is why it's important to be repeating that question in your head, aligning your energies so that when you're shuffling the deck, that energy is in there, increases the odds of possibly finding that answer to the question. Especially if you're doing it for a specific purpose. This is true for all cardomancy. I know we talk about the spiritual materialism that is very common and magical and in pagan circles, and I get it. There are a lot of tarot decks that I want as the artist, but there are a lot of Oracle card decks that I want as the artist. For it. That's great. That's wonderful. I found in my own practice, I have a lot of decks. There are some that I just vibe with better. I don't know if that's because the symbolism in it connects with me deeper. If it's because I am more open when I use them. And so they are easier for me to use. You'll start learning like the various magical equipment that you're using. You start connecting to it easier when you use it over and over and over again. I'm not sure if that's what it is, but with Oracle decks and tarot card decks, I have found that while I will see one that I really, really like and I'll get it, it doesn't mean that it's one that I will use very often. Most, most of the time, those are aesthetic purchases. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But if you're having a hard time connecting to either an Oracle card deck or tarot in general, you might need to set up, this is my practice deck. This is the one I'm just going to use for a while and not keep switching because you may not be connecting to it in the way that you should. This is where you don't have to have multiple decks. No. But having multiple decks can be nice because you may have one that you practice with. You may get lucky and find one that you drive with right away. It's what you want to use for your practice. You may have some that you want just for a LARF, like when you're fooling around and just goofing and having a good time deck versus the I'm doing more serious practice deck. You can have more decks for different occasions. That just depends on what you resonate with. And also what energies are you building into that deck? Because if you're using this particular deck every time you're being solemn, it's going to be a solemn deck. Yeah. That energy is going to be building up in it. Yeah. And it's going to impart some of that. Never be afraid of making your own Oracle for a deck. I think that a lot of us would do better if we did. Now, I know you're thinking, but I'm not an artist. Okay, stop right there. Level one. These don't have to be pretty. And I would say, especially if you're developing your own deck, your first iteration should not be pretty. Pretty is not what you're aiming for. Functionality is. When I first started reading about the Colbring runes, which is something that Yolo Morgano invented, I was like, I get that these go back to the 1700s. But then again, modern rune reading it only goes back to, I think, the late 1800s. Nordic Animism has a really good video about the history of how we read and interpret the runes for divination, and it's not as old as you think. It really isn't as old as you think. Most of our modern divination techniques are not as old as you think. But I looked at how the meanings ascribed to the runes and stuff, I thought they were really interesting. I could go through the process of trying to either make a set like what he describes in his book, or just start playing around with them. I love those half index cards, the little square ones. So I got those out and I he drew the rune on one side. I wrote the meaning of the rune on the other. So they're basically flashcards. But because of the way I knew that I wanted to use these, I could shuffle them up, hold them in the palm of my hand where I can't see what's there, then just pull one out and put it down. It's like having a back on the card where I can't see which 
one because they're small enough i can fit yeah. them in the palm of my hand i can't see if i'm pulling from the top of the deck or the bottom of the deck i can't see what i'm pulling out i can do this i started playing around with them what i found is personally i connect really strongly with these friends they work really really well for me i find them to be very sassy i find them to be very on point i've been reading readings for myself for other people using these and i don't talk about it too much because people are like but they were made up in the 1700s. Yes. Like most divination systems, they were made up in the 1700s. Like modern tarot reading. There are older schools of tarot that do go back further Italian tarot and whatnot. But the tarot that's in the little book that came with your cards is probably a version of A.E. Wade's tarot book. That's the 1800s, which is available for free online, by the way. If you want to read the OG. It's very easy to read. Highly recommend it if you're interested in the history of tarot. This has started me down a path where there's a chance... I may make myself a set of Oracle cards. I may make myself a set of Marines using them, but I may make myself a set of Oracle cards using them for things because I was able to test them out and see. I want us to try to move away from the spiritual materialism that we have to try to find ways to connect. I love my Divine Feminine Oracle card deck, and I use it quite a bit. I also have an Angel Oracle deck that a friend gave me that I also use quite a bit. I use them for different purposes. That's something else you'll start to understand. Well, your decks will have different purposes that you want to use them for. There are some people in the Divine Feminine deck that I don't really connect to. Like when I pull them out, I always have to look them up again because they, their history and their story just doesn't stick in my mind. I have no energetic connection to this person. And so there's part of me that's like, well, maybe I should just pull them out of the deck and not have them in there. Maybe I should work on my own Divine Feminine deck. And again, I would start the same way I did with this Colbrin deck that I made. But right now, like I said, it's very simple. They're just little index cards that have the root on one side, the meaning on the other side, and that's it. There's no imagery, no artwork. They're very simple. That was actually right in line with what I was going to suggest anyhow. For a first tarot deck, really the best thing to do would be just to get a stack of index cards. Just go online and get the top what the card is and then write the description right underneath of it for each one. In creating it yourself, going through that act of creation is going to be an investiture of your energies into it. So you're going to be more connected just by the simple fact that you created this from nothing. Plus, you have the lovely little helpful hints right there written out in text, which is great because that also helps, like flashcards that helps you get that. And you can practice and play with it, and you'll be A, learning what each one means. Also, then depending on what your background is, you can add in those little notes, like these were all cups this is all water emotion these are all sorts this is all air mental in intellect if you're like us you'll be like okay this is the sephira tributes so heck you could even put in if you need to some little tips on what is in each of the sephira realm to help and you have all that right there that's that you should refer to and it's a great way to work it's a great way to learn if you're going to do something like this try to get the vertical cards where yeah. the lines go down the long way instead of they're, they're traditional because they do make those and they're really nice for purposes like this. A lot of magic can be a financial trap because with, we see that beautiful deck, that 50, 60, $90 deck and oh, we want it. It's so pretty. It's so pretty. It's got the foil cards yeah. in it. It's so nice. It's your fancy edges. If you don't know that you're going to be grooving with this technique or you're just learning it, it can be very frustrating to have to flip to the book and flip back to the card and then back to the book. For each card, make yourself, a, just make yourself a teaching deck. As you're starting to learn the meanings you're finding in the cards, well, replace that card. But your meanings, how you're connecting to that card, to the energy of that card on there. Really start connecting because tarot is this wonderful place and oracle card decks in general. is this wonderful place where our practice, our craft, whatever it is, and our intuition meet and play with each other. As such, it becomes a very good way for spirit to communicate with us. One of the reasons I love my Azathoth deck that I'm currently using is because it is so hard for me to take it seriously because one, the artwork is gorgeous. It's gorgeous artwork. But also it's all the Lovecrafty and monsters and stuff. And so it's kind of a goofy deck in some respects. It's like earlier when we pulled the devil card, the first thing I started thinking of was Sabrina. And <laughs> just started laughing. Oh, so I was like, okay, fine. That's something that I really enjoy about it. And this could be a great way of learning any of the things that you need to learn. If you're trying to learn your herbs and what your herbs mean, make yourself an herb deck. Really simple. Get yourself some cards. Maybe do a little sketch of what the leaf looks like on the card. 
write down its properties on on the card. And you not only use them as flashcards, but use them for oracle readings as a way to connect to the urge and the stuff that you're trying to learn. Try to learn the correspondence of the trees. It's a great way to do that as well. And who knows? You may get to the point where you want to make images for these. By the way, you can go to Canva. Canva has a lot of clip art. It's a site called Clip Art, a little more stock photos and stock imagery. I'm old. I'm sorry. I still say Clip Art. <laughs> you can use to make yourself a deck. That's perfectly all right. You just print it out on cardstock, cut it out. I would advise you to get a laminator or to get a nice, good quality paper because, you know, cardstock lasts, but you'll have to print it out more often on just regular cardstock. There you go. Done. Simple, easy, to the point. A friend of mine has this little pocket printer that she uses for her photos that the pictures that it prints out are basically card sized, card sized and shaped. And I've thought to myself a lot, like I kind of want to get that because then I can just make decks and make a whole bunch of pictures and then just print out each card using this thing because it's pre-built in film. It's just the right size to make a card. I don't know if I'm going to do that or not, but I keep thinking about it. That's right. In this conversation, I have an inspiration of thinking, oh, I should make a kitchen oracle deck to help with deciding what the next meal's going to be. How it's put together. And um, I don't know if yeah. there's something there with that thought. I'll have to play around with it and discern it more. It could be interesting. Since our oracle decks or tarot decks are this bridge between our craft, because we're generally going to get imagery that connects to us in some way and our intuition. It is a great way for spirits and others to communicate with us and through the deck. Once you start tapping into that intuition, if you're trying to talk to a spirit using an oracle card or a tarot card, the spirit can help direct your intuition for what that card is really saying and help you to facilitate that communication. But you have to develop that intuitive skill first. You need to get to the point where you're not looking at the book anytime a card comes up and you know what that card means for you. And again, don't apologize if the card meaning that you feel from the card is not the one that's written specifically in the book. You may have a different relationship to the moon or the sun or the, the devil or any of the cards that are in there. Because when I see the devil, I see a card of accusation. But that's because of all of the associations that I have with the devil. We did an episode yeah. on, the, on oh, yeah. the many Satans, if you want to go back and look at that. Because I very often when I see the devil card, I'm like, oh, what's Mastama up to now? That's my personal inspiration that may not be yours and you need to be okay with that because i think a lot of people are very dogmatic when it comes to with oracle cards and tarot those meanings are just suggestions the sooner you can learn to see them that way and to trust your intuition it developed into an intuition that you can trust the better your tarot reading will be helped that's really it but this this is why to me we couldn't talk about tarot with the same time, we're talking about other divination techniques that we did on yesterday's episode. If you want to know about yeah. other divination techniques, we talked about that yesterday. And I find myself, as somebody who has dabbled with Enochian magic from time to time, wanting to spry the ethers again. I find myself thinking about this and going, but why though? But why though? Why? And this is something that is very good to do your discernments on and your divinations on. Like, but why though? Why am I interested in this now? Why is this suddenly coming up? Is it because I've found the whole the limit side of the internet that I've been watching a lot of their stuff? Because I find it very interesting to hear practitioners that practice similar but different to me talk. Is, is that just it? Is it because one of those people, Mavis, has been doing the spraying of the ethers and been making thinkings out of it? I don't know. Because you're being called to come today with them, the Cinebites want you to join them, Joe. Join them. Yes. Well, actually, I've I've come to a place where and I think, especially with the Nokia magic and all magic, you need to get to a place where you think things might be well. I think you know, the problem is I think the Nokia spirits played with John D and Edward Kelly, and while they did not lie, they did not really tell the truth about some of the things. Like the when John D was like, "I want to use this to spy on other nations," I feel like they were like, "Yeah, sure." So this is how you spy on Libya, like. I almost just like have this feeling that they were like cracking up in the background, like no, no, Mr. Fist. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I, I have some in the theory. back of my head. I got going. Never trust a spy, say that. Right, right. <laughs> so, and I've thought about several different ways to do this. I bring it up now in context of this episode. Is there was part of me going, maybe that should be an oracle deck that I make for myself. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Follow your intuitions, because maybe I want to get my black mirror out and light my candles and recite the keys and actually do the whole shebang. 
or maybe I want to use it for something else. I'm not sure. That's something that I'm currently playing around with in my own mind. I think we need to have a lot more fun with tarot, and I think we need to have a lot more fun with Oracle decks, and not be as locked in on making sure that we have the prettiest ones. Get yourself some index cards and make your decks. Yes, have the pretty ones. I'm not saying don't buy pretty ones. I, I would be a hypocrite if I did that. I have so many tarot decks, you have no idea. It's more of an A shoe box. Yes, I have, a, I have a lot of tarot decks. I love tarot decks. When you have an idea, explore it. Get yourself some cards, fill them out, make, make that deck, start playing with it. And like I said, there are ways to make that into a pretty deck eventually if that's where you want to go with it. It may be an inspiration just for a little bit that you need it for flashcards to learn a thing or maybe just to connect better to something. I don't think we need to be as precious as we are with a lot of this because I feel like, I don't know how to say this, there's a weird almost idolatry that comes with a lot of tarot decks and oracle decks of some great wise and light used soul came up with this and no honey, we're all just trying our best. That's it. Oh, I was just chuckling because my brain went, you know, actually if you set up the suits for your protein type, then you can start breaking it down in other ways. Because you don't want to necessarily be like, if you're just doing a list of meals, then you might as well just do a list of meals on the, you know, one on each card and just shuffle the cards and draw a card and that's your meal. Like my brain's wanting to go much further than that. So we may do a future episode on Briley's cookie cookery oracle deck. If the cookery oracle deck ends up becoming a thing. But if there's anything you would like us to talk about, do let us know. If you want a deeper dive on any of this, let us know. If you have special tips and tricks on how you read Oracle cards or tarot, do let us know. If you're listening to us on YouTube or Spotify, you can leave a comment right there. And let us know if you're listening to us anywhere else. Even if they say that you can leave a comment there, they don't tell us. So you can leave a comment there because engagement is awesome. And then go over to creationspass.com, click on chat, and we can leave it there. And then we'll get to see it. But while you're there, if you happen to have a few dollars you can pass our way, you can join and become a member. That money helps us to keep the lights on, keep food on our table, and keep a roof over our heads. You can also support us on Kofi and Patreon. I have CE Dorset on post. Thank you to everybody who does that. And if you don't have any money, you can help us to continue to get the word out about what we're doing. Share this on your social media. Share us with your friends. Share us with your circles of practice. I really love to see the growth that we have right now. And... I love some of the conversations that we're starting to have in the chat and in the uh, comments. Thank you so very much for all of that. It really does help out. And may the one life guide you to read the cards as well as you can and to connect to your intuition so that you might know them work into the meaning that is being delivered to you. Amen. Amen.